Good morning. So, I'm so happy and excited about today because even though we're not able to gather physically, we still are able to be in one spirit. We still are able to worship together, to pray together. We still are able to hear God's word together. And I'm thankful that we have this platform so that we can go, I mean, not only, I mean, we can go beyond these four walls. And so we can be connected at your home where you are and still get to do this together. And throughout the week, we will continue to give you updates about when are we going to get back together physically. And as well, just I encourage you to stay tuned on our social media and Facebook and Instagram so that we can update with you. Today, uh, I'm excited, and I want to continue to share on the series that we have been, that I've been sharing on, that I am serious. And so last week, I was sharing with you about Jesus as the door. And I was sharing with you, and we learned that Jesus as the door, he says, I mean, the access that he gives us into his presence, but we know as well that this door provides protection. When we enter this door as well, it provides for our needs. And thirdly, we know that Jesus, like he came to give life, but the enemy came to like destroy, to take away life. We learned that Jesus encourages us to live a life in wisdom, to live a wise life. Today I want to continue on this series and I want to share with you from the topic of um, Jesus, the true vine, when he said, uh, I am the true vine. And so we're going to look into John chapter 15 today, verse 1 to 9. And it says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you will bear much fruit. Showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in me, in my love. Before we continue, I just want to make a short prayer. Father, we just thank you that today, even though we're not gathering physically, we know that we're connected in one spirit. That we, to, we get to worship you. We get to hear your word. And we pray that today we will be encouraged as well, that our hearts will be encouraged. And I pray that your presence will embrace and touch everyone at home or at the place where they are. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. I don't know how many of you are passionate about sports. But if you are passionate about sports, then you more likely will know that last month, there was a famous competition going on. You might know that the competition that was taking place last month was the Super Bowl. Now, I am not very, I'm not such a football fan. I'm more like a soccer fan, but my wife is. And so recently, because we try to stay at home uh, due to these different reasons and because of our baby, we try to just program and do things at home together. And so I plan to make, I mean, to watch this game together with my wife because she likes football. But in order to watch the live game, you have to get this pass that actually allows you to see the whole, watch the whole season. And so this pass, I mean, you had to pay for it. 
And so before the game, just before the game, I decide to buy this pass just for that game. I mean, that's what a good husband does, right? And so I bought this pass and I paid for it. And the teams that were playing was Kansas City Chiefs versus 49ers San Francisco. Now, my wife, Jessica, she's from Kansas. Her hometown in the U.S. is Kansas City. Now, that means, I mean, you will more likely know which, I mean, team I was cheering for. Of course, I was cheering for Kansas City, for the Chiefs. Originally, I, will, I would have cheered for San Francisco, for the 49ers, because I have family in San Francisco. But now, you know, I had to support my boss, I mean, slash my wife. And of course, you know, it was actually a fun game. It was very exciting. And we really had a good time. It was very exciting because Kansas City, like this whole season, like they over, like basically they, they made all the season that come back. Like every game they were losing, they were down. Like they were halfway through the game and they were still losing. But somehow they managed to flip the game and overcome all of the other games. And so they end up winning. And this game was no different. Like they actually, I mean, started playing and they were down. They were losing. Halfway through the game, they were still, you know, losing. But then suddenly they started to flip the game. And they started, they started to, like, recovering. Basically, on the last five minutes of the game, they score a touchdown. And so now they are ahead. And... On the last three minutes of the game, like the most exciting moments, minutes of the game, suddenly our live stream, our connection, we lose the connection. Suddenly the like, live stream just got cut off. And so we're going crazy and my wife is telling me, you got to fix it. Try to fix it. Do something. And I'm trying on the computer. I'm like, I'm trying, but it's not working. I'm trying to repair the live stream, the connection, to get back the live stream and to be able to watch the game. She's telling me, try to do something, and you have to do it fast because it's going to end up soon. Don't watch the cell phone. Don't watch the news. Make sure don't watch Instagram or anyone who is posting. So just make sure to, to, to fix it. But because I wasn't able to fix the live stream, like we weren't able to watch the end of the game. Like the last minutes of the game, we weren't able to see that, to watch that. I mean, the biggest game of the year. You see, this is what happens when we lose our connection. When we lose our connection, we can miss out big time. When you're not connected to the source, it can mean that you can miss out. How many of you know that actually, like, being disconnected from the source or not having a good connection with the source, it could mean that you will miss out big time. It could mean that you missed the last minutes, more, most exciting minutes of the game or something else. And it is the same for us as believers. When we are disconnected or we are not having a good connection with our source, Jesus Christ, it could mean that we can miss out. It can mean that we can miss out even fulfilling their purpose in our life. Today, we're going to look into John chapter 15 as we continue. And in John chapter 15, we see um, on this I Am series, we're going to continue to understand not only who, what Jesus does, but as well we want to continue to understand who Jesus is. Because how many of you know that in order to improve in our relationship with someone, you have to know who that person truly is. Jesus starts this scripture, these beautiful verses, and he says, I am the true vine. And these a statement or words that he says, like they're very important. Just with the first word, true, that actually means or he's saying that you can be connected to another vine, to different vines. That could be fake. That could be not, that they cannot be real. And so he says about himself this claim, I am the true vine. This is statement that he says about himself has deep meaning. Especially for Jewish culture back in the days, this word vine was used 
when they express, when they refer to God's people. And usually this word was actually used in a negative context. When it was used in the Old Testament, it was usually used as a way to say that God's people were not fruitful. Therefore, they were going to experience the wrath of God. Now, Jesus, he comes, our Jesus, he comes and he changes. He came to earth and came to change like their theology, to restructure, I mean, their theology. And so that's why he says, I am the true vine, meaning I can, I mean, I am that person. I am like, I am the true vine. Like, I am who you cannot be. I can do what you cannot do. So therefore, you got to chill. I got this. Like, you haven't been able to produce the fruit that you should be able to produce, that, should be, that you should be producing. But that's fine because I am divine. I got you. Like, fruitfulness now will be possible through me because I am the true vine. You're not the true vine. I am the true vine. And so what you have to do is that you just have to remain connected to me. We see that through these verses, there are actually um, three main characters or role that, roles that take place in these verses. First, we have the vine dresser, who is God. Secondly, we have the vine, who is Jesus. And thirdly, we have the branches, who is us. And the fruit is that which will be produced as a result uh, of being connected with the vine. And so Jesus, we see that he says, I am the true, the true vine. We see that Jesus, he shows up on their story, on this story, right? And he says this statement. And I believe that's the story of our lives because Jesus can do, you see, what we cannot do. Like very often we try to work hard or we try to strive, sometimes thinking so that we can be upright or so that we can be morally correct. And it might work for some time until we realize that we fall short. That it doesn't matter what we do. At some point, we might fall short. But because Jesus now, he enters into all this picture, into this story, into our lives, he can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Jesus, he is the true vine and he produces what we can't. Therefore, we can expect to be pruned. You see, the vine... Any vine is able to produce when it is well taken care of. When a vine is, like, provided food, like, when it is also provided, I mean, appropriate water, when it is pruned in the right way, then it can produce, um, it can produce fruit. And so our Heavenly Father, we see that He rewards any growth with pruning. Now, this might sound like, mm, for some people, or when, like, it might sound like, ah, uh, I don't know. Because for some people, sometimes they don't feel comfortable when they hear this word pruning. Sometimes people think of this word and relate this word to punishment. But let me tell you that it is not. There is a reward in pruning. There is a blessing in pruning. I like to watch sports. And one of my favorite sports is Formula One. And I like to watch Formula One. I like to watch to see how it works. I like to watch to see teams, how teams work, and how even technology is involved. You also have a coach, you have a team, and you have a driver. And so when the driver is racing on the track, like they are basically, they are blinded to many factors. They have to rely on the team, on the coach, because they're not able to see the whole picture. Because the team actually has lots of computers. They have and are able to just monitor like the car, the engine, like how is it running, how the tires are doing. Like they're able to monitor even the driver, their, like his body, his heart rate, basically everything. And so sometimes what happens is that they will tell the driver like to do certain things. Sometimes they will ask the driver to make certain decisions, even though it doesn't make sense for the driver. Sometimes the driver won't understand really, like, why are they asking to do certain things. Sometimes they will ask him to make a pit stop, and even though it doesn't make sense to him. But this is for the success of the whole team. 
This is for the success of the driver of the whole team. Like what they're trying to do is to help the driver to race, to go faster. They want to help the driver to drive to the best of his ability. Now with our Heavenly Father, when he prunes us, is so that we can produce more and better. So it's not punishment. It's more like a pit stop. When they ask you to make a pit stop, it's actually to fill you with gas, to put you new tires, to basically equip you with more and better so that you can go faster, you can go further, so that basically you can fulfill your purpose. Now, what is the kind of fruit that we should be producing? And that's a good question. Like, is it a better career? Is it a better job? Is it a better position in leadership? Well, I think that is actually it's more than that or it goes deeper than that. Because we see that in the scripture, in the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verse 22 to 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So when God says, when He says that He will prune us, it's so that we can grow in all these areas. Now these fruits, they're not, I mean, these actually, they're not individual fruits. They are one and the same. You see, I will be wrong if I tell you, I give you a description of a tree and tell you that a tree can produce different fruits like apples, orange, all by the same tree. That will be wrong. And so what God is telling us is to embody those fruits. That's why we, I mean, see nowadays that in recent versions of the Bible, actually, rather than using the, they don't use the word fruit in some versions because the text can be in plural. And so God is not saying, I will prune this apple, I will prune this orange and this a grape, because that would mean that you will have to slice that orange. And so the characteristics that the Bible is talking about is basically, are basically the ingredients that make up f- for that one fruit. So they, you see, they are not isolated. You basically cannot build them up, build them up individually. Like it will be impossible for you to like grow in them like individually or separately. Because we cannot grow in love and not grow in actually patience and joy. When we grow in love, we grow in kindness. When we grow in love, we grow in self-control. So it all happens all together. So when Jesus tells us and when he says in the scripture that he's going to prune you, is so that we can produce, I mean, it's so that we can produce more and better. It's so that we can become more like Jesus. It's so, so that we can become more and more what he has called us to be. So that we can produce more and better. Because Jesus is perfect love, his perfect patience, his perfect self-control. And so it is encouraging to see what he's telling us. Because you're giving fruit already. Therefore, this is awesome. I am going to prune you so that you can produce even more and better. So I want to let you know today that it could be that you might feel like you are in a season where you are being pruned. And if that's the case, let me tell you, it's not because you did something wrong. Instead, it's because you have been able to produce. And God wants you to continue to grow. Therefore, he, as a reward, he will prune you. Now in the kingdom, like there is, we see that God created all of us, I mean, to produce. In the kingdom, actually pruning does not equal a penalty or does not equal um, just um, punishment. Jesus, since the beginning, God, since the beginning, created us to produce. That's why we see in the scripture, since the beginning in Genesis, that he blessed them and told them to be fruitful and multiply. Or maybe you remember a story in the New Testament when um, there's a story of the workers in the vineyard. And so the landowner tells the workers, like he gave them a certain amount of money, denarius, to each of them. And they... He told them to basically, like, produce. They, he told them, I mean, gave them this, and they had to, like, make it work. They had to invest and produce, make a profit, and then return that to the owner. 
We see since the beginning, God created us in such a way to be productive, to produce. He designed everything on earth to actually produce, to be productive. Even the creation, it says that it glorifies God as it fulfills its purpose. And so it's this beauty in which like creation was created, this cycle that glorifies God as they fulfill its purpose, what they're supposed to be doing. And that's why we see, I mean, when we take a look, for example, at a tree, when we see an apple tree, it produces apples. But inside the apple, there is apple seeds. So this apple is able to produce, you see, this uh, seed can produce more apples. That means that within the apple, like, there is the potential to produce thousands of apples. Because God created us since the beginning with the purpose in such a way so that we can be productive, so that we can produce. Now, the productivity that we see that God expects is not by striving, but is by remaining connected to the source, to the vine, so that we can bear fruit. Therefore, pruning is a blessing. We see that Jesus after he tells his disciples in the scripture to, um, to, I mean, that they will be pruned, he continues and he tells his disciples in verse 3, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. So he tells, I mean, he tells them, you're already clean. Now this is happening when he tells them you are clean. It's just happening this, I mean, scene 24 hours before they betrayed him. Before one of them say, like, I don't know that guy, I don't know that Jesus. Yet, Jesus said, you are already clean because you have believed in me. Because you have believed in my word. And this word, which by the way is interesting, this word, word, is the same one that is used for pruning. That's what the scripture or the word of God does. It prunes us. So we are in God's presence not because of what we can do, but it's because of who he is. Our God, He's not a God of perfection, but He's a God of growth. He's, he was telling His disciples, you already have been pruned because of what I have been speaking to you. It means the pruning is not, you know, with a punch or with a slap. Pruning is not actually with yelling. It's by speaking, by speaking the word. And so Jesus, He came to earth to restructure, I mean, the way they were thinking. Like he came to restructure their belief system so that they can produce more and better fruit. Maybe you remember the story as well in the scripture when James and John, they're on their way. And they had to go through a Samaritan village. And these Samaritan people, they basically, they didn't want to let them go through. And after this is taking place, I mean, as this was taking place, John, he, I mean, got upset and he thinks that he has a great idea. And so he says, well, I'm going to go tell Jesus. And so he wants to go tell Jesus about this idea, thinking that it's a brilliant idea. And he goes with Jesus and tells him, hey, Jesus, like these guys, the Samaritans, they don't want to let us go through. Like we have to get to a certain place. We have to, I mean, go there. We have to get to some place and they're on our way. So I have a good idea. Why don't we just call on fire and just remove these guys from our way? Like, why don't we just basically delete them, right? Like, remove them from our way. Now, Jesus, hearing their, uh, what they were proposing, he was like, you guys, right? Like, even though, I mean, they were telling, John was telling them this to Jesus. And he says, but don't worry, Jesus. Like, we will make sure that the people know that is for your glory, that you're the one doing this, so they will glorify you. I mean, these guys seem to me that they're more like part of a cartel more than part of, you know, the disciples, because what they were asking was just, you know, really out of normal, it seemed to me. But Jesus, when he hears this, his, his response was, you guys, you don't get it yet. I didn't come to take away life, but I came to give life. Yet Jesus, he doesn't remove them from the group. But what he does is that he helped them. 
he basically restructured the way they were thinking. I helped them to see the issue. They help, he helped them how to see the issue. I mean, these guys, they actually were committed. They were passionate to serve. Even though they make many mistakes, like many, they were still willing to say, yes, we want to learn. Yes, we want to be part of this. Like, we are willing to learn. And I wonder if that was us, like, what would be our tendency? Like, if we have people like that in our social circle, if we have people like that on our life group or on our ministry team or our companies, and after making such a mistakes, like, what would be our response? More likely for some of us, we will say, bye, ciao, see you, never again. <laughs> but Jesus, he didn't do this. Jesus, it says that he was not, I mean, he was not actually affected by their mistakes. Instead, Jesus, what he does is that he was calm and then he empowers 70 more. I mean, who will do that, right? Like, who will empower 70 more after what they did? If that was me, more likely I would be stressed trying to, I don't know how to, you know, deal with these people. But not for Jesus. We see that Jesus didn't punish them. The reason for that was because he was committed to see them succeed. Often he will put them in places where they were able to hear God's word, that, where they were able to hear God's instruction. And so this is how God works. It's not usual leadership. It's kingdom, it's kingdom leadership. It's a different kind of mindset. It's not what we might be used to in this world. It's different. On the other hand, for us, it could be that sometimes we make mistakes. And when we make mistakes, we might not know that we make these mistakes, just like the disciples. For some other people, it could be that you make these mistakes, and then what happens as a result is that it basically clips you away from God. Like you have these thoughts, and you say, well, I don't think I can come to God. Like maybe it is that you have, um, or you used to have a challenge with certain area and you were fine but these recent weeks you had been just stressed with work and just at home dealing with some things and so you just fell as well in temp again in temptation and then you're thinking well I cannot attend church I cannot I mean worship God and go deep in worship I cannot do I mean I cannot connect with people and the reason for this is because often when we tend to offend, we tend to avoid. This is what happens. Maybe you've done or experienced this before. And I remember when, um, like, I was a kid, I used to, like, tease my sisters. I used to just joke around and tease them. And sometimes I will make them cry. And my mom, she will get upset. And when I know her coming on her way, I know something bad is going to happen. And I remember that she will tell me, like, go to your room. I'm going to correct you. And so when she says that, I know that something, you know, is going to go bad. So I will go to my room. And when I go to my room, I will just start putting, you know, like socks and stuff on my pants. Kind of like just to make that, you know, reduce the pain that is coming, that I see coming ahead. And so you've probably done that before, but... I remember that after she um, spanked me, like she will tell me, hey, after your dad comes home, we're going to talk. And so when my dad got home, I remember that my dad, I mean, every time he got home, he didn't know what was going on. He, didn't, he was not angry or upset at me. Like, and I already was spanked by my mom. But I will still want to stay at my room. And the reason for that is because when we tend to offend, we tend to avoid. Like that is our human nature. What we do is, like as humans, is we will try to avoid to connect. We will try to avoid to get close to people. And sometimes that is like our, as well true with our relationship with God. Sometimes what we do in our relationship with God is that we try to avoid. Instead of being at the light to come before God and connect with Him. What we do sometimes is that we avoid from our side because we think 
that we have to be fully clean in order to come to him. But God says that's not how it works. He says, I mean, he doesn't ask you to go clean yourself so that you can come. But he asks you to come so that he can clean you. And so he's the other way around. Jesus is having this discussion with his disciples and he tells them, abide in me so that I will abide in you. He's telling this to his, to his disciples just before he leaves. And we know from the scripture that Peter, I mean, one of the disciples, lovely Peter, like his personality seems to be a little strong and he's a little intense sometimes and talks more than what he should. And Jesus tells his disciples, come, come, let's go out. And he tells them, hey guys, this is what's going to happen. You guys are going to betray me. When Peter hears this, Peter, lovely Peter, he says, no, no, that's not going to happen. Like Jesus, that's not the case. Like even if everyone fails you, I will never betray you. And Jesus replies, Peter, Peter, Peter. You see, by the time the rooster crows tomorrow, by the time the rooster crows three times tomorrow, this will happen. Like you will deny me three times and with cursing. Peter responds, no, Jesus, I won't do that. Like I won't do that. That's not me. I mean, he still has the courage to respond. Like he was so sure of himself that he was so sure that he was not going to fail Jesus. I mean, who does that, right? Who will argue Jesus? Like who knows better than Jesus? And he still says, no, Jesus, I won't do that. Like, even if I had to die, I will never betray you. Jesus tells him, Peter, Peter, okay, if that's what you think. Well, but this guy, he was telling Jesus that he was never going to betray him. And at first, it seems like, like, actually, I mean, Peter was right. At first, it seemed like he was correct with what he was declaring because when the Pharisees and the guards came to arrest Jesus it says that Peter stood up and he took out his sword We're like where are you taking Jesus you cannot take him and then he I mean used his sword and basically like cut like the guard's ear and Jesus response was like Peter why are you doing this like he grabs the ear and he has to stick it back into the into the guard and what's going on is that the disciples they scatter they take Jesus to court to be tried and Peter goes with them. He is actually at court, but he's covered and he's trying not to be seen by people. And as he's there at court, it says that he's trying to not be seen by the rest of the people there. And a girl comes and talks to him and asks him, like, are you one of those guys that was with Jesus, with that guy that is there? He responds, he responds, no, I don't know that guy. That's not me. I don't know that guy. Then the girl asks again, are you sure you're not one of those guys? Like, you look like one of them. And Peter's response was like, no, I don't know them. I don't know that guy. The third time she asked again, are you sure? No, you are one of them. I remember I saw you walking with him. You are one of those guys. And then Peter explodes, basically. And he says, I'm not one of those guys. I don't know that man. I don't know that FGC and whatever Jesus you're talking about. And at that moment, the rooster crows. It happened just the way that Jesus said it was going to happen. When the rooster crows, what happens is that Jesus turns to Peter. Peter is looking at Jesus. And in that moment, Peter, his heart was broken. He realized what he just did. And the scripture says that he decides and he runs away. How can this guy that said that he was going to be there for Jesus, that even if he had to die, like he was never going to betray him, he ended up betraying him. I mean, this could be, I mean, what else could go wrong? What else could get worse in your relationship with Jesus, right? Like this is probably the lowest point in your relationship with him. But then this says, after all this happened, like after the death and resurrection, the disciples are back to normal life. And they are doing normal life fishing. And Peter is with them. And as they are fishing, one of them sees Jesus on the shore. 
And Peter realizes that as well. And he says, that's Jesus. And Peter now, instead of running away, instead of hiding, he does the opposite. He tears down his clothes. He jumps in the water. He swims to the shore. When he gets to the shore, then he runs towards Jesus. It says that he runs towards Jesus and he throws himself at Jesus and worships Jesus. He went and worshiped him totally the opposite with what he did before to understand our place in God's presence is to know that in him we don't have to avoid anything we don't have to avoid instead we can actually draw towards him regardless of what we have done in our past the crazy, crazy, amazing thing about Peter was that this guy that basically was running away, that was hiding, this time he didn't run away. Instead, he jumps. And that's crazy and so good about Peter. He now jumps in the water and he goes to where Jesus was. I mean, all the disciples, they were trying to get to Jesus, yes. But it was Peter, the one that actually makes all the, you know, like all the dash to get to Jesus. He jumps and gets there as soon as possible. He understood that if we understand who Jesus is, we won't want to run away from him. But we will want to run towards him. Because we know that when Jesus says, I am the true vine, he is saying, I will do what you cannot. I will be what you cannot. You just have to come to me. Don't let an imperfect life stop you from encountering perfect love. In verse 5, it says, Abide in me and I will abide in you. Because without me, you can't do anything. What he's telling us is that he expects fruitfulness. But at the same time, he's telling us that without him, we cannot do anything. What is he trying to do? He's trying to draw us near and tell us that we need to be fully dependent on Him. In order to be fruitful, we will have to be fully dependent on Him. But we don't have to worry about the fruit. The only thing that we have to worry about is just to remain connected to the source, to the true vine. And when we are connected to the true vine, the fruit will be natural. The verse goes continuous and says, when a branch is no longer connected, it has lost its purpose. Because what happens is, when it is no longer connected, it's just like a stick on the ground. And so it will just be thrown away. In early uh, days of my just journey of dating my wife, I remember that I would buy her stuff in the beginning, just before even we started dating, I would buy her gifts. And sometimes, quite a few times, she didn't like my gifts. I mean, of course, she didn't say that, but I could tell. And you know how guys, how we are. I'm like, man, this is so expensive. Like, I did this and this. Of course, I didn't tell her that, right? But in my mind, I'm like thinking. But it was until our relationship progressed, until we were walking together, as, until our relationship progressed, we got much better. I got much better at understanding what she desires, what she liked, what was on her mind, what was also she wanting to get. And we got to a point that we're, we were able to connect hearts. And it is the same with our Heavenly Father or in any relationship. In verse 7, he says, tell, I mean, he tells us to remain in me and keep my words. And you will see... I mean, you will see what the result will be. Because when we remain with Him, when we progress in our relationship with Him, we will know and understand what His, high, what his heart desires, what He is thinking. And as a result is that we will be able to produce fruit, much fruit. We will understand what He desires, what is in His mind. And so the prayers that we make, actually will be aligned to his will because we know what he desires therefore it says at the end of the scripture 
that he will answer any of our prayers and that's how he will be glorified today as i am sharing this scripture with you and this message i just want to close in prayer god is inviting us into a journey because he is actually more concerned about connecting with us he is he values the journey more than the final destination because he want to be connected he wants to be close to us we don't have to worry about the fruit because that will be they will that will come by itself when we remain connected to the right source i want to pray with you today i want to encourage you today just to ask the holy spirit what he is speaking to you see one of the good things about remaining connected to the vine is that as children as sons and daughters of god that when we remain connected to this source we will be able to produce fruit no matter the season regardless the season we're in we will be able to produce fruit so if we are in a dry season if we are in a rainy season if we are in a season that it's humid that is so hot that seems to be like the desert that will be fine we still be able will be able to produce fruit if you're in a season where people are dealing with anxiety with fear when there is panic all around the world where there is just you know like people are panicking they're really worried about what's taking place if you're in a season where pain is all around the world and things i mean might not make sense the good thing is that when all of these things are taking place you can still produce peace you can still have peace in your heart you can still have true joy in your heart you can still have love in your heart regardless of the season you will be able to produce today i want to pray for you and if you're at home or wherever you are i just want to ask you to invite the holy spirit just ask him what are you speaking to me today i want to pray for you holy spirit we just thank you that you're with us we know that you're for us and i just ask today as we heard your word that our desire will be to continue to walk this journey with you that we want to walk close to you no matter the situation or what is taking place we know that when we remain connected to the source then the fruit will be natural we thank you because of your love we know that now you're able to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves and we thank you that as you're inviting us into this journey for some it could be that we're believers already but jesus is inviting us to enter in a season where we get to know him his heart in deep ways in greater ways we thank you i bless all of you who are at home who are watching from the phone wherever you are at i bless you today and i just ask god and his presence to be real to embrace you there that you will experience his presence at home and that what is taking place or going around the world i pray that you will not be overcome by fear but that you will remain hopeful that you will remember who is your source who is taking care of you we thank you i bless all of you in jesus name amen amen thank you thank you god bless you see you next week and just to remind you next week we are actually going to be online we're gonna live stream so connect with us invite your friends we'll be here and we will let you uh, know updates about when are we gonna get back again god bless you and have a wonderful week